what I want to cover with you is not just how human beings are amazing for our ability to speak to each other, uh, but I want to go over our process of conversation and then a bit about how we speak to machines. And I want to help you understand how to make the machines that have voice interfaces stronger and better for people to use. So the first thing that we have to talk about if we talk about conversation is about uh, the rules that we follow every day. And uh, the first of these rules is one that lets us live in cities. And it's one that um, we have to break in order to have a conversation. And this rule is one where uh, when you're walking down the street anywhere in the world, so whether you're here in Lisbon, if you're in San Francisco, uh, if you're in Beijing, if you are walking down the street, the one thing that you are sure to do is that you do not make eye contact with another human being. Uh, so as we walk, we notice that there's another person there and then quickly look away because uh, if we make eye contact with another person, that's a form of recognition and it invites conversation. And we don't actually want to have conversations with every single person we see on the street. And so uh, the first thing we need to do if we have a conversation is we need to look at another human being. So that's the first step. And that is called recognition. So recognizing that we would like to converse with each other. Now, after you have this recognition, you have to have a greeting. And this greeting process is different from um, country to country, and even within countries, it can be different. But a typical American greeting pattern, um, which is potentially like longer than German greeting pattern, but shorter than a Persian greeting pattern, uh, consists of anywhere you go, somebody saying, hi. And the next person says, how are you doing? They don't care how you're doing. We just say it because we feel like we have to say it. Uh, this is part of a ritual that we have for greeting. So first person says hi, and this doesn't matter if you go to um, get a coffee at a Starbucks or you are um, seeing relatives that you haven't seen in a long time. They also do not care how you're doing in the initial greeting. Um, you have to say, I'm good, how are you? If you say anything else other than that you're doing well or things are good, that's a problem because it breaks the ritual that we have in terms of a greeting. Even if things are going horribly in your life, you need to tell them that you're doing fine. And then later on when the real conversation starts, that's when you can tell them how you actually feel. And you need to ask how they're doing and they need to respond that they're also doing well. So this is the greeting and it's uh, completely meaningless, but it establishes that you're having conversation with another person and that you've both decided to participate in this conversation. And then after that, you actually get to have the initial inquiry, which is the question, uh, for example, in a coffee shop of, what can I get for you? Uh, so it takes a lot, uh, making eye contact with the person, having an initial inane, not especially meaningful set of conversation turns, and then finally you get to have your initial inquiry. And these are essential parts of all conversation. And so what I want to do is have you listen in on a phone recording. This is from the Santa Barbara Corpus of Dialogue and Language, and it's a series of recordings that are made available for researchers where you can listen to conversations between people that have been recorded. So these are um, over dinner time, as a couple is falling asleep. Uh, this one is a phone conversation between a young couple. Uh, one of them is in California on the west coast of the United States. The other one is in Pennsylvania, so in the middle of the United States. And I have to warn you that the conversation we're going to listen to, and we'll listen to several parts of this conversation, uh, is a very personal conversation. Uh, I might have parts of it um, that make you uncomfortable, and it is in general uncomfortable to listen to um, a couple's private conversation. But they have volunteered to be recorded, and their voices have been changed slightly so that they're not recognizable. Uh, so let's take a moment to listen to this conversation. Hello. How's my favorite girl in the world? Hey, baby. Who's, who's the girl that I love? <laughs> who's the girl that I'll do anything for? <laughs> I'll wash her feet with my mouth. <laughs> oh, honey. <laughs> How are you? After a 10-mile run. Ew. I would. Ew. I would. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, I'm doing good. Oh, I miss you. Oh, I miss you too. That's my favorite girl. I'm is she, good. Is she okay? Uh huh. Are you guys having fun? <laughs> there is like TMI did not need to know about the 10 mile run, feet licking. Um, it's not how every conversation goes, granted. But uh, these, this is a pretty typical conversation. And what's interesting about it is that, so here's a transcript of it. And the at signs, uh, it's not Twitter. That's actually a symbol for laughter. So anytime there's an at in there, somebody is laughing. And you can see in this conversation that uh, it follows the rules that we just talked about. So it kicks off. And it's like, hello, and then, hey, how are you doing? And this guy, instead of answering the how are you doing part of the conversation, um, which he gets asked a couple of times, he's talking about licking her feet after a 10 mile run. And she keeps me like, no, how are you doing? She wants him to stay on track with the ritual and go over the first parts of the conversation. So even though um, he's like, how, I want to wash your feet with my mouth after a 10 mile run. She even here is still like, no, really, how are you? She's not ready to have the rest of the conversation until he answers that initial inquiry. So we zoom all the way to the bottom. And then finally he goes, I'm doing good. And then they can continue with the rest of the conversation. You can see over and over again in the conversation that in conversational transcripts, that what's happening is that people do not let a conversation advance until the initial greeting component of the conversation happens. So within a conversation, uh, these different uh, turns people take back and forth are part of a turn-taking model. And the turn-taking model can uh, go in a few different ways. So what's nice is that for anyone here who uh, works in design, it's a flowchart. So that should feel really comfortable for most people here. Uh, and what happens during conversation is that you have somebody who's the current speaker, and right now that's me. And during a conversation, I can choose the next person who speaks. So I could literally say, you know, Alan, what do you think of voice interfaces? And I'm selected the next speaker. Or um, the next person who wants to speak could choose to speak themselves. So uh, somebody could pull a Kanye West, run up here, grab the microphone and decide to be the next speaker. So we have this person who they can choose to speak. Um, you can't, so I can choose. Somebody can self-select. They could pull a Kanye on me. Um, and then that person becomes the current speaker. Or um, I can keep talking. So it can just be speaker continues. And if I keep talking, then I uh, can become, maintain my status as the current speaker or I could just stop talking. In that case, the conversation would end, and that would be really boring. So this is the component of a turn-taking model. And as you, we listen to more of the conversation, you'll be able to see, and I want you to pay attention today, is when people self-select to start speaking. Um, it's a little more difficult in a conference setting if people don't know each other. But when somebody calls on another person to become the speaker, or when a conversation ends because nobody volunteers more information. So those are the ways that we take turns, and that's the order in which we can take turns. But it doesn't really tell us the rules of conversation. And these rules of conversation are uh, termed Grison maxims. And these maxims tell us of uh, the principles of conversation. And they're descriptive. They're not prescriptive. So if they describe um, patterns in conversation that have been observed over time. They don't tell us how to have one. Uh, these maxims do apply to most cultures around the world, um, except uh, Madagascar. So uh, in that case, um, one of these maxims does not apply. So the first is that we say what is true. And what's remarkable about, about that is that until you, really, um, until you really start thinking about it, whenever we have a conversation with each other, we believe what the other person is saying because we assume there's truthfulness to everything the other person says. So when I tell you my workplace, uh, you assume that I am telling you the truth about where I work. 
or what my last project was or how many children I have. Um, imagine every conversation here um, and how much more difficult it will be if you didn't believe everything every other person said to you. Uh, and, how much, and so we have a degree of trust in each other. And we assume that whatever we say to each other is true. The next you of these. You know, it's like such a momentous occasion. Oh. <laughs> when it came out positive. And then I Let's thought, listen to this one. Support, like, I know I wouldn't have it or anything, but I thought if the slight chance I would have it and it really became a person someday, yeah. wouldn't they love to see the photograph of the EPT with the positive sign on it? Knowing that that was like its first sign. It's a pregnancy life. test. Uh -huh. Oh my God. It's <laughs> not my idea of a good time right now, Sadie. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe somewhere down the road. But right. So she was like, I would love to, if I had a positive pregnancy test, I would love to save it to show my kid in the future. And he's like, no, I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. And for most, I mean, it's like, and I can see if your parents pulled out a pregnancy test, you know, when you're 15 years old and tried to show it to you, you'd be like, oh, that's kind of gross. Um, for people who aren't familiar with pregnancy tests, it's a thing that you pee on to find out whether or not you're pregnant. Um, and so what happens in this conversation is that the first thing that he says is something that's true, or is he's like, I don't think that's a good idea. And generally, we tell each other the truth when we're having a conversation. And the next part of this is that we are as informative as required. So we don't say um, any more than we really need to say in a conversation, and we don't say any less than we need to say in a conversation. Uh, this is broken all the time on television. On TV, people always say a lot more or a lot less than is needed to know in a conversation because it makes for an interesting story. But in real life, between human beings, uh, we just say what we need to say to each other. Uh, and so let's listen to an example of that where um, the issue of the pregnancy test didn't come up because it wasn't relevant to what was happening. Oh my God, honey, how come you've been keeping all this inside? I know, I didn't mean to keep it inside. I mean, I, I didn't mean. But you mean love me. <laughs> I didn't mean to not tell you at all. It was just we would hang up the phone, and then I thought, oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that I'm kind of late. Because I didn't think it was a huge deal. But then. So <laughs> people are like, what? It's a huge deal. So, so she has had multiple conversations with her boyfriend, and she's totally forgot to tell him about this pregnancy test and that she ha um, was late. Uh, because it wasn't really important to the conversation they were having. It wasn't necessary for her to tell him that at the time. Um, and it wasn't relevant to what they were thinking about. Oh. Anyhow. So how are you outside of that? Good, good. We had such a nice day. It's really beautiful here. It's like, it is? Uh-huh, like 70 degrees and sunny. And we walked around. We went to a park. And we just talked and talked and sat in the sun, and we had such a nice day. We went out for dinner with Joy. So out, uh, after she's like, yeah, I didn't really tell you about that pregnancy test. It just didn't seem important at the time. Then finally goes, well, aside from this pregnancy test you never told me about, how's life? And at that point, they completely switch gears. They both agreed that the pregnancy test is no longer relevant to the conversation, and now they're talking about the weather. And it's something that human beings are really good at, is that we talk about what is relevant at the time in a conversation. And so it could be that we start talking about the weather. And as soon as somebody switches over to a new subject, so let's say we then start talking about um, the triathlon that's going on outside over the course of the weekend. Um, if somebody else starts talking about the weather again, and it's not in the context of the triathlon, it's incredibly confusing. So we try to stay relevant to what's happening. And the last is that to be um, perspicuous. And this means that we're following these cooperative principles of conversation as we speak with each other. And that we are um, doing everything we can to keep a conversation going and really thinking about whether or not what we say uh, makes sense, is truthful, is just as much as we need to say in a conversation. And as people are talking to each other, um, what's happening is that uh, our thoughts, for example, me, um, the thoughts are very focused on coffee right now. And um, if I ask someone if they would like to get a cup of coffee, what happens is I send uh, signals from my brain down to my vocal cords. Uh, my vocal cords create a sound wave. And that sound wave is heard by your ear. And then uh, about 30,000 um, 30, nerve endings send that information up to your brain. And if I do a good enough job of describing getting a cup of coffee, so um, 
hey, let's walk down to uh, the coffee shop and get a cup of coffee, then what I can do is create a picture of that same thing inside of your brain. And that's what we're doing over and over <coughs> again when we speak to each other, especially when we use action-oriented words, is that we're creating pictures in each other's brains. But this doesn't tell us anything about what a machine sees. So um, if I say, would you like to get a cup of coffee, it looks like this. Uh, this is my own uh, waveform for would you like to get a cup of coffee? And you can tell I'm from um, the United States because would and you are combined into a single word, which is would you. And then the rest of it is the would you like to get a cup of coffee here. Uh, this is not actually what a computer is making sense of. So what it does is it actually takes this waveform and turns it into a spectrogram, which has three dimensions instead of just two for understanding information. So this is the exact same phrase, but in a spectrogram. The, color, the parts that are bright yellow, that's intensity of speech. And if you look at enough spectrograms over time, or you take a course on them, you can actually learn how to read spectrograms to understand what people have said just from looking at a spectrogram. So a natural language system takes this spectrogram. Let me start with a human being. And they say something. And the end of this is called the endpoint. And I have to tell you that when it comes to uh, endpoints, come on, computer. So when it comes to endpoint, what's happening all of the time is that any machine that's a voice UI is really just waiting for you to stop talking. It has to wait until you're done talking so it can figure out what you said and make sense of it. And so that means that um, if you go and look for uh, scholarly papers on voice interfaces, there are a lot of great ones from researchers at Amazon, at Microsoft, at IBM, at Google, and also at SoundHound, about how they are trying to reduce the amount of time it takes to understand the end of a set of speech and then to start processing that language. Um, I have to say that as a person who lives on the west coast of the US, my pauses between parts of speech are really long. Uh, Deborah Tannen, who's an esteemed uh, linguist, she, she found that when she had a bunch of friends over when she was in grad school, and uh, she had friends from the east coast of the US and friends from the west coast, that at the end of the dinner time, people who were from the west coast felt like they did, didn't really have a great time because they could never get a word in edgewise. And her friends who were from New York City felt like the people from the West Coast never really took part in the conversation. And that's because uh, if you live on the West Coast of the United States, you have pretty long pauses between sentences when you're speaking. Uh, whereas if you are on the East Coast of the United States, you have a much shorter pause between sentences, which means that you're, you're not waiting as long for somebody to jump into conversation. And so uh, it's definitely something to be aware of if you're from a place where people speak quickly and you're talking to anyone from California, is that uh, we're much slower. It takes us a long time to get started talking. And the pauses between our sentences are much longer than a lot of other places in the United States. Uh, so that's really nice for uh, a machine system that takes one sentence at a time. It's really frustrating for any system that wants to hear multiple sentences because it means that it thinks I'm done over and over again before I'm really done. A machine takes that spectrogram and extracts features from it. So it's looking for phonemes, it's looking for the tiniest parts of speech. And then what it does with these tiny parts of speech is that it figures out, um, it takes apart all the sounds and figures out what are the different parts of speech and then uses those different parts of speech to get to natural language understanding. This happens in a couple of different ways. Historically, it's used something called a hidden Markov model. It's okay if you don't know what that means. Um, and now, a lot more systems are using neural networks to determine natural language. While all of this is happening, a thing called a dialogue manager is keeping track of everything that the natural language system needs to know. So, uh, if you ask a natural language system, how long will it take me to get to uh, Lisboa Marina, then what it needs to keep track of is what is the time right now, what is the time when you'll get there, um, where is the place you're going to, where is the place you're coming from, which type of route are you going to take, and then needs to convert all of this into actually generating natural language. Right now, most of the systems we use, um, 
they have a preset number of words. So if you think about something like the Amazon Echo, it sounds really remarkable because it actually has a very limited number of responses. Um, something like uh, Google Now is starting to create more natural language and doesn't just have pre-recorded responses, so it actually doesn't sound as good. Um, but it's trying to generate these natural language um, through speech synthesis. So in some systems, you'll have entire sentences recorded. In others, you'll have single words recorded. And then in another set of systems, you'll have phonemes recorded. And those phonemes can be put back together to create new words. And once speech is synthesized, it comes back to a human being as a waveform that we hear. So I want to show you a little bit of how a hidden Markov model works. Uh, does anyone know what the word is up here? Tomato. Uh, so what it does is it's a statistical analysis. It essentially says, um, all right. We just heard a, a T sound, a T, and then next we heard ah, and then mm, and it goes through for each turn and says, what's the probability of each of these sounds happening? And in the end, when each of these sounds happened, what word was that? And what's crazy is that you, we started with hidden Markov models, but now we use a neural network that has an enormous hidden layer. Uh, the thing I really <laughs> want to uh, emphasize with the neural network is that um, when I say hidden layer, I mean literally people have no idea what's happening in the middle part here. It's completely hidden from human beings to be able to understand or see it. Um, but a brief overview of how it's understood is that if you take a neural network and you input a bunch of data into it, for example, about Paris, and then you subtract all of the data about France, and you add in Italy, data, then the neural network can determine that uh, what you're talking about is Rome. Uh, and it's, it eerily feels like magic. And because you can't see inside of it and it's hidden, you don't know how it happens. Uh, and the same thing actually happens with something like summer. So you can take the concept of summer represented in data, take out sun, add snow, and you get winter. And then also with uh, a very American example of having baseball. If you take away the concept of bat from baseball, but you add in racket, the neural network says the closest thing this data has is tennis. Um, and so when we're thinking about how we interact with uh, speech systems, and not just hidden Markov models, but neural networks that um, perceive information in a really different way than human beings, what's really important is to know that like, our brains aren't like machines. And the things that are in machines that we call brains are not like human beings at all either. Uh, they're two completely different worlds. And what's really important for us is not to uh, make systems that make it easier for people to talk to machines, but to create machines that, um, that really follow our own cultural practices that we already have in place. So what I want to cover is how we can create stronger voice UIs. And these conversational interfaces can really be improved uh, in what I call the four C's. So making sure that we have cohedence, co cohesion, cadence, context, and that they're comprehensive. So first of all, cohesion. Um, cohesion is the glue that holds language together. So when I said something like, so, that's a discourse marker. And those discourse markers are what makes a conversation make sense. I want to show you a sentence. Um, my kid only eats rice. He can't survive on that. Uh, who is the he here? It's my kid. Um, what is that? Rice. Rice. Okay. Um, that's a mind-boggling thing for a computer to understand. Uh, but most people in here can get that pretty easily. Uh, those substitute words are parts of creating a cohesive conversation. If I said over and over again things like, my kid only eats rice, my kid can't survive on rice, I would sound a lot more like a machine than an actual human being. And so it's important to make sure that the voice interfaces we design uh, actually have cohesive language. A form of cohesion that, uh, an example of where cohesion didn't really come into play, um, on Google you can say to it, how tall is the Burj Khalifa? And it gives you an answer. And then I said to it, where is it? 
And what's neat is that Google now can understand pronouns. So that's nice. It knows when I say, where is it? I'm talking about the Burj Khalifa. But then what it does, which is really, really frustrating, is it changes it. While you're looking at it, it changes it to where is the Burj Khalifa, uh, which is a really unhuman thing to do. Uh, the, it's for clarification, but it also says Burj Khalifa a couple of other places on the screen. And so it's not really necessary to do this, and it actually breaks the cohesion of the conversation I'm having with that interface. The next is cadence. And this is where it's really important to have a voice interface that has uh, an incredible amount of intelligence and a lot of recordings behind it. And cadence is rhythm and stress and intonation. So with something like, do you prefer New York or LA, what's happening when I say that is when I say New York, my voice goes up. And when I say LA, my voice goes down. Uh, what's interesting is that once you get to three parts, it's New York, LA, or Seattle. And so if you're recording for a voice interface, that means that for every single word, you have to have it in different intonations and different pitches on the way up and on the way down to make sense. And technology is getting better in terms of being able to uh, synthesize different pitches and different emotions, uh, but it's something that's really essential. Uh, and any time you want to have a, find out whether or not a voice UI is really great, ask it for something that could be in a list or a long sentence, and you'll see that um, the stresses and intonations just aren't quite right. The second to last one, and second to last is a form of cohesion, if you're keeping track, is context. So if I ask you uh, the weather tomorrow, where do I want to know the weather for? Right here, where I am. Where are we right now? In Lisbon. I didn't have to say, hey, do you know the weather for Lisbon tomorrow? And you'd probably look at me a little strangely if I asked you what the weather was for Lisbon. Um, because we're here right now and we both implicitly understand context. On a device, we have to set context. So here's a setup screen from Amazon Echo. And you can see that I have a lot of Amazon Echoes. And um, that mine is in Santa Cruz, California, in the United States. Um, if, if you have an opportunity to get information in advance from your customer, then that's really helpful. So during the setup process, the Echo asks you to tell it where you are. And it's really nice because at that point, um, it can give me weather without me having to say, what is the weather for Santa Cruz, California? Um, and it's important as you add new features to a system to prompt your user to add additional information, like what is their work location, so you can give them commute times as well. The last thing that voice interfaces aren't really doing, um, and it's the most difficult of all of these, is to create something that's comprehensive. Uh, this is a small portion of the questions you can ask in Amazon Echo. And Google has its own, um, all of the different actions that you can take on a, a Google product. And as long as we need lists like this, then people aren't going to use voice interfaces. Because if we think about conversation with another human being, uh, it doesn't have a failure mode where it asks us to um, install a new application or um, tells us that we can't do something. Anytime we converse with a human being and we have a mismatch in understanding or a person doesn't get what we're talking about, we can ask for clarification and we can learn from each other. But voice systems aren't universal and they're not comprehensive. And so uh, until they reach uh, a level of comprehension, they'll always be thought of as expert systems that can just do one thing. So if you have a voice system on your TV, it's going, you're going to make assumptions about it that are relevant just to your living room. And if you have a voice system in your kitchen, you'll make assumptions about it in your kitchen. And so the real challenge is creating a voice system that can be as flexible and dynamic and can learn the way a human can, or at least maybe better than a human being. Um, and so if you want a conversational interface that really works, uh, it will need to have cohesion so it doesn't sound stilted and like a robot. Uh, we need to have excellent cadence, the right rhythm and stress and intonation. It will need to understand context and it will have to be comprehensive.
And if we can do all of those things, we can go from having a voice interface that somebody has to talk to to one that people love. Thank you very much.